Okay, so today we're going over density management. And so what this whole week is about, last class we learned about the different thinning methods, but this class what we're doing is deciding and lab this week and the next class, we're deciding how do you decide when to thin and how do you decide how much to thin. So that's really what is guiding all of this. And so when we look at density management, we have to think about how thinning is gonna impact a stand, okay? Um, and so one big question is, you know, how many years do we wait until we thin? What sort of factors is that going to depend on? And what I have for you here is a couple different photos of Ponderosa pine stands. Uh, the stand on the right there has a basal area of about 90 square feet per acre, and that stands 115 years old. And it's been managed without a whole lot of thinning. The stand on the left there is a much younger stand at a similar basal area, and they've gotten there quicker by thinning it throughout the rotation. So thinning is really gonna impact, especially when we think about an even aged pure forest, it's really gonna impact how quickly your stand is gonna move through that stem exclusion phase of stand dynamics. So as we start looking at it more, um, here's a graph where we're looking at the volume in cubic feet per acre um, of both the wood that's been removed in thinnings and the standing wood six years after a thinning was done. And so this is data from the Virginia Tech Growth and Yield Co-op. They had a region-wide trial, so they put in lots of plots all over the South. Um, and they put these plots in in stands that were eight to 25 years old, so mid-rotation stands. Then they tracked them out over time. Um, so six years after thinning, you see the blue bar on the far left is, left is unthinned. The orange bar in the middle is lightly thin twice, and the gray bar on the right is heavily thin twice. <clears throat> so which scenario do they end up moving more volume in or having more volume that they can remove? Six years after thinning, it looks like the heavily thin, or sorry, the heavily thin twice option has the least total volume, uh, whereas the unthinned option has the most total volume. But you have to pay careful attention here. Um, when you interpret graphs, uh, people can do all sorts of different things to kind of lie with graphs, right? Or fudge the facts. Uh, so if you'll look at that y-axis, it's not zero to 3,500 or 3,300 there. It's 2,950 up to 3,350. And so this graph is making that look like a big difference when in fact, it's a very small difference. So the difference between that unthinned at about, you know, 3,325, and heavily thinned twice at about 3,100. Remember 100 cubic feet is about three tons per acre. So if we convert that, we're looking at, you know, 93 tons per acre versus 100 tons per acre. So it's only a, a seven ton per acre difference. So that's a quarter of a long truck worth of wood. So it's not a big difference there six years after the thin. And then when we look at it 21 years after the thin, the trend reverses. But again, that axis, you know, it's only going from about 5,500, 5,600 for the unthinned stands up to 6,400 cubic feet per acre uh, for the heavily thinned twice. So if you give it enough time, your merchantable volume will actually be slightly better where you're thinning, regardless of whether it's heavy thinning or light thinning. Um, but early on after a first thin, you may see that reduction in overall volume. So doesn't look like huge differences even short term, long term. But then you start looking at the product class distribution. And we looked at this a little bit last class at the beginning of class with lava oil pine plantations where you're simulating, you know, different product classes you're getting out at different planting densities, right? Um, so here's the impact of different product classes you get out with different thinning regimes rather than different planting densities. And so as we look here, that top left graph is chip and saw trees. The more you thin, the less chip and saw trees you get. And these graphs all do have zero at the bottom of the y-axis. These graphs are telling a more accurate story here than the last ones were. Um, peeler trees, those are going to be for plywood where you can peel the tree and use it for plywood. That's a higher value product um, up there comparable with saw timber, maybe a little bit more. And you can see by thinning, you know, with the heavy thinning regime, you can almost double the amount of peeler trees you remove per acre. And then on the far right, we have utility poles. So this is using poles in the sense of utility poles, not as in a pulpwood size tree. And so you can look, we go from five to 12 
utility poles per acre. Um, and so those are 15 inch diameter class 65 foot tall trees. And so it more than doubles. <clears throat> utility poles are going for about $55 a ton. So if you get a few more utility poles per acre, they're worth more than twice what saw timber is. That can really be a disproportionate impact on the value of your stand. So thinning, again, it's giving you, it's, it's just like planting with those different densities, right? If you get it right, it's giving you less of the lower value products and more of the higher value products. And it's doing that by favoring site resources on the trees that you want, right? So we can tie thinning in to a lot of the other treatments that we're gonna do. Um, so here's an example on the left of a stand that was thinned and that was all. So pretty good looking stand. But that stand on the right, they thinned it and then they fertilized it at a pretty normal fertilizer rate. Uh, we'll go over fertilizer here in the coming weeks. And what you can see here is look at the leaf area on the trees. If you look up in the canopy, there's a lot more shade in that photo on the right where they fertilize than there is on the left. It's carrying a lot more leaf area. So that's the photosynthetic engine that's gonna grow even more wood. And so when you look at the response there, this is the seven year diameter growth rate because that diameter is gonna be critical in bumping us up into better product classes. So in a stand on the far left there where they didn't thin and they didn't fertilize, the trees grew 1.2 inches over that seven year period. And seven years is one rough ballpark between different timings of thinnings, five years, six years, seven years, somewhere in there is gonna be pretty typical. Well, when they fertilized, it added an extra two tenths of an inch over that seven years. When they thinned it, it added an extra three tenths of diameter growth rate. And when they did both, the interaction was additive. You got the 0.2 plus the 0.3, which was 0.5. And so when you thin and fertilize together, it's gonna to help you move into those better product classes even more so um, than if you just thin alone. So combining these treatments is gonna be important. Now this, this study, if you look at it, it was thinning and fertilizing. Did they need to apply weed control in this scenario? Would you be happy cruising timber on that stand? Yeah, they, they don't have a huge weed problem there, right? Look in the overstory, it's almost all pine. So you probably wouldn't see much of a growth response from competition control there because this is a stand that doesn't have a competition control problem. Now, if this photo had a stand that was 20 foot tall of Yopon, you would probably see similar data here to a competition control treatment. And the fertilizer may not be as responsive because if you don't kill that Yopon, the Yopon is going to be using your fertilizer, right? Um, so thinning, weed control, um, fertilizer, they're all manipulating similar site resources, nutrients for those trees. Okay, so we know thinning is increasing diameter growth rates on the trees that we leave. And we know it's moving them into better product classes. And so what we wanna do for the rest of class here is look at some more technical stuff on how different types of thinning are gonna be more immediately impacting the diameter of our trees. And some of what we're going over here is gonna be uh, critically important for the lab you all are gonna do this week. Um, so pay attention to this section and I'm recording this and I'll post this so you'll have access to this as you're working on that lab. So you already saw the mini lecture where we went over three different ways that you can quantify increment in a forest, where we had current annual increment, periodic annual increment, and mean annual increment. And this is, you know, not real data. This is hypothetical data, so it's very smoothed out here. But what you tend to see, current annual increment gives you a good reflection of what's going on right now, because it's just, what was the growth last year? What was the growth last year? But the issue with that is you pick up a lot of real world variability. So over this past summer, how well do you think our forest trees grew in East Texas? Probably a pretty good summer, okay? It never really got super hot. We had well dispersed rainfall throughout the summer, probably higher than normal rainfall totals. And so we probably had pretty growth in this past year. You would expect all of the things being equal current annual increment to be high for this past growing season in our region. But if you look at a year like 2011, where we had that severe drought, there would have been very little growth over that growing season. So current annual increment can fluctuate wildly depending on what's going on in your area in that given year from a weather perspective. Treatments like thinning and other things that happen in a given year can also have a big impact on current annual increment, right? And so current annual increment is going to go up, it's going to peak, and then it's going to decline because your stand is growing rapidly early on, and then that growth rate slows down. So you see that real 
peak response. If you're worried about current annual increment fluctuating widely for whatever you need to measure increment for, you know, tons per acre per year, you can use periodic annual increment. And so that's just a rolling five-year average or a rolling 10-year average. You can pick the period that the average rolls over. So now it averages our pretty good growing season this year with the five previous ones where some of those may not have been as good. And so it smooths out the wild variability, but it follows a similar overall trend. And then the one we've been using mostly is mean annual increment, where mean annual increment now we're dividing it over the lifespan of the entire stand. And so it's gonna follow kind of that logistic growth curve looking pattern. It will peak at some point, and then you'll typically see a slight decline in mean annual increment. Where it peaks, if you keep harvesting where it peaks and starting a new rotation, that's sort of your biological maturity of that stand. That would grow you the most total tons per wood per acre on that land in perpetuity. We often don't manage it to the point of culmination of mean annual increment because typically when you look at the financial situation, your peak profit profitability will occur before that. Because you can see before it peaks, it starts leveling off. So you would actually want to move to the left and catch it right as it was starting to level off there. So that's before it actually ends up peaking. So, so that's a little bit more on increment. And so what we want to think about now is how are these different types of thins going to impact increment? And we're going to do that by looking at the relationship these types of thins have on the diameters, diameters of our stand. So I told you we're going to be using letters A, B, C, D, E for pretty much everything. Well, it gets more confusing than that because here we have a D over D ratio. So we're just using one letter, but you can see we've got it lowercase and we have it capitalized here. So the numerator in that fraction, the top number, the lowercase D, that's the diameter of the trees rolling out of your stand on the log truck. So imagine you go to the end of the log truck, you find four and a half feet from the ground, you know, maybe three and a half feet off the stump on each tree. It's the size of the trees removed in the thinning. The capital D, the denominator of the fraction, the bottom of that fraction, that's the quadratic mean diameter of the stand prior to the thinning operation. So that would be you going out and doing a timber cruise, you're wrapping diameter tapes or calipers around trees, you're eyeballing diameters. That's that mean diameter in that stand prior to the thinning operation, okay? So after a thinning, if that ratio isn't equal to one, if you don't remove trees that are equal to the average size of the trees that are in that stand, your thinning will immediately change the diameter. And so let's look a little bit at how some of that, that happens. So I've got some diagrams for you. This is plotting the basal area of the stand out on the left axis in that blue line. And again, this is kind of hypothetical data, so it's a little wavy there, but you see a series of things, okay? Each thin reduces the basal area, then the stand grows back. Each thin, subsequent thin reduces the basal area. Okay, then you see that red solid line below the sort of spiky line. That's gonna be the capital D, the bottom of our fraction. That's the quadratic mean diameter of the stand at any given time. And then you have the green X, the lowercase d, the top of our fraction. That is the diameter of trees going out of that stand on the log truck in each thinning. So each X there is marking a thinning. So if we look at this, what type of thinning is this gonna be? Is this gonna be a low thin, a geometric thin, a crown thin, or a selection thin? Just looking at that data, you should be able to tell. So use common sense on this. What size trees are being removed relative to what's out in that stand? So they're removing little trees, right? You can see the green X's are below that red line. So what type of thin is this? It's a low thin, exactly. So this is a low thin because you're removing the smaller trees. You can look at that red line. What's the impact of each thin on the quadratic mean diameter of the stand? It's small, but it's there. It makes it go up, right? So when we look at this, how does thinning affect QMD? Here's a low thin. I cut down the little trees, okay? So imagine you cruise this stand, you figure out the average diameter of it, then you remove these trees and go back and, and cruise the stand again. What, what diameter are you gonna get compared to the first time you cruised it? It's gonna be more simply because you cut down little trees. So we increase the average, okay? If, if I wanted to get a higher class average in silviculture and I drop the people with the lowest grades, 
the class average would go up, right? Same idea. We can't actually drop students easily as faculty, so don't worry about it. But um, so that's what you're doing. You're actually increasing the diameter. It may not be overnight. It may take you a week or two, feel longer to do this thin. But, you know, over a period of a few weeks, this isn't growth. This is just removing those smaller trees. So if we look back at this D over D ratio for a low thin, what's it going to be? Relative to one, not the actual number. Is it more than one, less than one, or equal to one? It's going to be less than one. You have the little trees that are removed relative to the stand. So the lowercase d is smaller than the capital D, so it's a fraction less than one. Okay, so here's what this looks like. Um, and these diagrams come out of your textbook. Um, and so as we look, we have an even age stand characterized by that normal distribution. And then what we do, we, we have the capital D, our pre-thin QMD right there in the middle of it. You can see that cross-hatched area is the trees that we remove. That's the lowercase d, that purple line. And so we're removing the smaller trees in that stand. And so the D over D ratio is less than one. That purple number divided by that green number is less than one. And the impact it has on the stand is that you get that higher QMD. So that's going to be a low thin. Okay, here's another scenario, a different type of thin. What type of thin is this? So we've already seen a low thin. So is this a geometric thin, a selection thin, or a crown thin? Okay, so the green X's are bigger than that red line. So we're moving larger trees relative to the stand. And so that fits our definition of a crown thin, right? Um, is there another type of thin this could also fit? What's that? Okay, well, high grading we're hopefully not doing is a silvicultural treatment, right? But what treatment did we go over that are in our region would end up resulting in high grading? So we'll get more into diameter limit cutting. That would result in high grading. But what of our types of thinning, remember, in our region ends up leading to high grading? Yeah, so the selection thin. So remember, in a crown thin, you're removing dominance and codominance to grow your other dominance and codominance. In a selection thin, you're removing dominance and codominance to grow lower crown classes, okay? So in either case, you're removing bigger trees relative to the stand. And so you remove those big trees to grow the small ones. Okay, we're gonna see it drive the diameter of that stand down. And so here's what the crown thin would look like, where we have that same capital D, our pre-thin QMD, it's the same stand prior to thin we just saw the thin. And then you remove those larger D divided by the big D. Is it more than one, less than one, equal to one? What's it gonna be? Yeah, that lowercase d divided by that capital D is, is a number larger than one. You're dividing a bigger number by a smaller number, so it's more than one. Okay, and then the impact of a crown thinning on your stand is that it results in a lower QMD. So if you go out and cruise it after the thin is done, you're expecting a lower mean diameter in that stand because you cut down those larger trees. Here's that selection thin. Okay, and so you can see in the selection thin, you really remove the largest trees in the stand. That crosshatched area is way out there to the side. And so it's doing kind of the same thing as a crown thin. But what's that lowercase d over capital D ratio going to be on a selection thing compared to a crown thin? Is it going to be more than a crown thin or less than a crown thin? So if I do that lowercase d over the capital D here versus here, which is going to be the bigger number. Yeah, selection thinning is going to have a much larger d over d ratio because that's a larger lowercase d. And in these examples, it's the same capital D. So if you divide an even larger number by the same number, it results in a, in a larger outcome. Okay, so what are we doing here? Yeah, that could be a row thin, corridor thin, geometric thin. Uh, we don't have enough detail there to tell. But here's what's going on. You can't see our three different shaded lines anymore because they're all the same line. Okay, 
So I didn't have very many of those little trees on the far left, but I removed a third of them. I didn't have very many of those big trees on the right, but I removed a third of them. I had a lot of these average trees right in the middle and we removed a third of them. And so in a geometric thing, you cut trees in proportion to how frequent they are out in the stand. Because if you just cut down every third row of trees and your trees are randomly distributed in the stand, you cut a third in each size class. So the trees on the log truck have the same average diameter as the trees that are out in the woods before the harvest. And if you go and you cruise the stand before and after a geometric thin, you don't change the average diameter, okay? You would have exactly a third of the number of trees out there. You would have, or sorry, you would have exactly two thirds of the number of trees remaining out there. You would have exactly two thirds of the basal area remaining out there. Remember our equation for QMD? You don't have to remember the whole equation, but remember it includes trees per acre divided by basal area and particle. So if you multiply the top of a fraction by two thirds and the bottom of a fraction by two thirds, it doesn't change the fraction, right? And so that calculation of QMD is gonna be the same before and after a thin. Um, and so there's your row thing. What's our lowercase d over capital D ratio here? Divide a number by the same number and it equals one, right? So here's all that summarized for you. So in a low thin, your D over D ratio is less than one. In a geometric thin, like a row thin, it's equal to one. In a crown thin, it's greater than one, but it may not be much greater. It may be 1.05, okay? In a selection thin, it's significantly greater than one. It may be like 1.25. So it's gonna be a larger number. So that's how thinning ties into the different diameters in our stand. This stuff's gonna be important to remember as you're trying to plot these hypothetical thinnings out on these different diagrams. You know, you'll see Q and D on both diagrams we're gonna be using in lab this week. And so you'll be able to think about the type of thin you're doing. You'll be able to think, okay, it's gonna increase the diameter. So I need to reflect that. The diameter is not gonna change. So I need to reflect that or the diameter might decrease. So I need to reflect that. And so use the D over D ratio to figure that out. Okay, when we look at that impact, it actually has on the diameter. So if it's a low thin, the diameter increases, okay? So we talked about our different grades of low thinning. Our diameter, depending on the grade of low thinning we do, can increase from a factor of 1.05 up to about 1.20. But remember, typically we're doing a grade C low thinning. Um, so uh, we've got data for East Texas basically showing with an average grade C low thin, the diameters increase by a factor of 1.09. So if you get stuck on the lab this week and you're like, well, how do I know how much a low thin impacts the diameter of my stand, that's how you know, okay? So if I have a stand with an average diameter of 10 inches and I do a typical grade C low thinning, afterwards I expect the diameter to be what? So it impacts it by a factor of 1.09. So basically it's a 9% increase in diameters is what you're seeing. So if my stand was 10 inches before the thin, what is it after the thin? Not a trick question. Too early for math. 10.9. I just moved the decimal place over one because I multiplied those two numbers together. That's all you do. And so 10 was an easy example to work with. So 10 times 1.09 is 10.9 inches. So after a typical grade C low thin in a 10 inch stand, I would expect the diameter to be almost 11 inches, 10.9 inches. What if my stand uh, had an average diameter of seven inches? What's my post thin diameter gonna be? I think I heard someone say back here, 7.63. So seven times 1.09, it's gonna be 7.63. So it's just 9% of that seven, nine times seven is 0.63 because it's 0 0.09. So you move that decimal place over twice. And then, you know, you add that to the seven. So 7.63 inches. So that's how you figure out how a typical grade C low thin impacts the diameter of a stake. 
Okay, um, so let's uh, go ahead and see if we can start applying some of these concepts. So you've got a scenario where you have naturally regenerated short-leaf pine stand. There's a basal area, there's a density, and there's a quadratic mean diameter of the stand. So you've cruised it, you have some basic data. Um, and you know your landowner objective here, they wanna develop a dense understory for woodcock and wintering sparrow habitat. So they know for those species, they want a basal area of about 60 square feet per acre. Now they are gonna do this as a free thin. So you can target trees on spacing. You don't need to target trees by crown class. So that simplifies things because you don't have a lot of data on different crown classes out there. And so you're out on the stand, you know that information, you know your target, you have a paint gun in your hand and the other people in your group also have a paint gun in their hand. How do you all figure out how you're gonna go put paint on trees to leave and not paint the trees that you wanna cut? Or up the other way around, you can paint the cut trees and leave the leave trees unpainted. So figure out how you're gonna in your group come up with a way so that you each paint, you know, a third of the stand, a fourth of the stand, however many people are in your group, and you come out with a pretty uniform 60 square feet per acre of basal area across the whole stand. So any questions? So split up in your groups, work on that, and when you're done, you can come uh, write your guidelines up here on the board. Okay, so uh, here's all your responses, and so we got a pretty good range. Um, a number of you wrote up an answer, erased it, and then wrote up a different answer. So I added some of the earlier answers back in. So we've got everything that everybody wrote up here in one form or another. And uh, so do you all find this easy? Was there an intuitive way to come up with this right away? No, there really wasn't. And there's two reasons for that. Um, one, I kind of threw you into the deep end and we haven't really gone over methods to do this yet. That's what we're gonna do next. But I wanted to get you thinking about it a little bit first. And two, this is a hypothetical scenario. So there's more information you would probably like uh, in order to answer this. Uh, but these are pretty typical range of answers I'll see on this exercise. And so first off, you're trying all sorts of different types of thin. So one group initially wrote up a third row thin before erasing it. Can you third row thin this stand? There are two words on there that say you cannot third row thin this stand. What are they? Naturally regenerated. It wasn't planted, there are no rows. Now, could you execute this concept? Absolutely, you could corridor thin the stand, take down you know, 10 feet here, skip 20 feet, take down another 10 foot swath, and that would get you there. But if your average trees are 10 inches in diameter, you know, I, I don't know if you necessarily would need to do uh, that geometric type of thin. Okay, and then a couple groups wrote crown thin, and the guidelines may be good on the crown thin, but why can't you crown thin this stand? What up there says you're not crown thinning it? It tells you you're doing a free thin. So it's telling you what type of thinning you're doing. So there's no reason to change it to a different type of thinning. And also with the crown thin, you remove the dominant and co-dominant trees to grow other dominants and co-dominants. And in the real world, you would be able to do that. But in this hypothetical scenario, you know, you don't have any information on what crown classes are and how that's related to your basal area. So um, it might be more difficult to do that here. Um, and then let's see here, we've got an area thin. What did y'all mean by area thin? That's a new one. <laughs> like a specified area, like of a one thing. Okay, so, uh, so, so you're using spacing? Huh? So you're using spacing? So basically you're, you're trying to space your trees out on a one chain grid, is that what you're trying to do? No. No? This is square chain area. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's going to remove how many square chains are in an acre? Um, I can't right 10 square chains per acre. So if you took four square chains per acre out, that's removing 40% of your stain. Yeah. So you're kind of maybe doing a geometric thin, yeah. depending on how you space that out. Or it could be based on spacing. And so this could be a free thin. So I've never seen the term area thin used before, but you know, the concept you're describing could be a free thin or depending on how you do it, it could be a geometric fit. So, yeah, so you're using some notion of spacing. 
And so you can see, you all came up with a target, and this was the most intuitive way to come up with a target in this scenario. You could figure out that if you removed a certain percentage of your basal area, you would hopefully be able to remove that same percentage of tree spraker and end up hitting your basal area target. So it's easier to work on a tree spraker basis. And so one group even figured out that um, that's removing two thirds of your stand, leaving one third of your stand approximately. So if you tell someone with a paint gun in their hand to keep every third tree, do you think you can get that reasonably well implemented on a stand? Yeah, that, that would be a reasonable marking guideline where you could actually go out there and you could see how you could do that, okay? Spacing would be a, a reasonable guideline. I don't think one square chain plots is necessarily gonna get you there, but using some concept of spacing uh, could probably get you there. If I just tell you all, go leave 100 trees per acre, 103 trees per acre, and I send you all to a different part of the stand, how consistent do you think that job's gonna be? Based on what we've seen in management plans over the years, very inconsistent, <laughs> extremely inconsistent. Um, and so with all these options, you know, that may not necessarily get you to what your desired outcome is. Here's the other problem though, and, and it's a problem not in what you did, it's a problem in the lack of information you had. This assumes that you're removing every third tree on some sort of fixed spacing and that the trees by the end of that will have the same average diameter of the stand, that 10.3 inch average diameter. But if for some reason you don't remove trees at that average diameter of the stand, you're not gonna get your target basal area. So if you mark every third tree and they happen to be larger than the average QMD, that's gonna reduce your basal area below 60 square feet per acre and vice versa, you remove you know, smaller trees, you're gonna be leaving more than 60 square feet per acre out there. So every tree is not average, right? So that's another thing that we've got to consider in there. Okay, let me set up the share again here and let's look at some tools that we've got that could help you all with this. But one thing to keep in mind as we look at this, just telling someone to leave a certain number of trees per acre may not get you to what your desired target is, but you all are hopefully getting better and better at spacing, using your pace, eyeballing distances, and we can hopefully, if we can use spacing, get a little bit more accurate. So there's two rules that the reading mentioned just very briefly and didn't really explain, but one was the DX rule, the other was the D plus X rules. So these are guidelines where you look at the diameter of a tree, okay, so you find a tree you want to keep, you eyeball its diameter, you multiply it by X, and it tells you the space around that tree to cut everything in. So as you move through a stand, identifying leave trees and working through an area, um, this will sort of help you space those trees out. So as you start walking into the stand, you find a good tree you wanna leave, okay? If I'm using a DX rule of 2.0, okay? What I do is I eyeball that tree, uh, that tree is 10 inches in diameter. I multiply my 10 inches by two because I'm using a DX rule of two. And I need to leave 20 feet around that tree without any other trees. So now I either mark that leave tree and see that I'm cutting all the trees within about 20 feet of it. I move outside of that 20 feet and I look for my next keeper tree, my next leave tree that's gonna be another, you know, it's probably another 20 feet away if it's a 10 inch tree. And I move through the stand in this manner and I space that out. If I find a good 20 inch tree, I need to leave 40 feet around it because I'm using a DX rule of two. And so you can kind of see as you move through the stand, you're using this concept of spacing to very simply mark out the stand. And now I can keep trees of all sorts of different diameters. And again, it depends on the scenario. You can paint the cut trees, you can paint the leaf trees, whatever's gonna work best in your scenario. That doesn't sound like it's gonna give you a set basal area though, right? But if you look at that, what you're doing is you're leaving a certain amount of wood. If I have a 10 inch tree, it has a basal area of 0.5454 square feet per acre. And so if I leave a certain amount of land area around that, I'm targeting a specific basal area. So what this rule actually does, there's the equation and you can see the 43560, that's our square feet per acre. So that's the piece in there that's your land area the 0 0.005454, that's all your conversion factors, and there's your basal area. So we've plugged all that into that equation, 
you don't ever need that equation because I've given you the table where I calculated each of these target basal areas on the left. I calculated what the DX rule would be. Now I said we often use X between 1.75 and two. If you look, that's what it's doing. It's leaving us basal areas between 75 and 60 square feet per acre, depending on the X factor that we use, which is kind of a typical range to thin a stand down to, which is why we use that X factor. So it's purely based on the geometry. Uh, we could go on a long technical explanation about that, but you probably don't need that. You can sort of get the rough concept without it. So to mark this stand down to 60 square feet per acre, you could have just used a DX rule of two. So you could have done exactly what I just described. And as you had finished working your way through the stand, the basal area, if you'd done it well, would have been approximately 60 square feet per acre. And you could have left big trees out there, smaller trees. You could have varied it as you wanted throughout the stand. Okay, so there's a relatively simple tool to implement, a little more complicated on how the math works behind it, but pretty simple to implement with timber marker. The D plus X rule is similar. Um, and you've got the, the D is your QMD after the thin. So you're gonna use it the same way where you're eyeballing a 14 inch tree. If you're using X plus six rule, you leave 20 feet around it. Okay, but you need to know what target diameter you want after the stand, what your QMD is going to be after the stand. You need to know what your target basal area is after the stand. And so you typically use a D plus X rule of six. But if you want to create your own custom D plus X rule, the process is kind of involved. So here's a slide that works you through the whole process. We don't need to go through this in a ton of detail. Um, I'll post that slide so you can look through it on your own. It kind of works you through the whole scenario. But it's just coming up with basic assumptions. So it's saying, what does my stand look like before the thin? How much do I want to remove in terms of basal area? You've got to know those things. We already went over the impact that a typical grade C low thin has on QMD. And what was that? You're going to need it for the lab this week. So if I do a typical grade C low thin in a 10 inch QMD stand, what's my QMD after? One point oh nine times that ten inches, yeah. So there's that factor. So I use that to project what my dam diameter is going to be after. And once I know what my diameter is going to be after the thinning, I can figure out the basal area of one tree. I know the total basal area I want, so I know how many trees per acre, average trees per acre, will yield me that basal area. And so from that, I can simply figure out how many trees per acre I need because I know the basal area of one tree. I know the total basal area of the stand. So I know how many trees I need to leave out there to hit that target. And then you can see you're just using the square root of it. You're figuring out how many square feet you need to leave per tree, taking the square root of that. And so you're coming up with this idea of here's trees on a square spacing. It'll hit that basal area target if they're all average. And then you use that to come up with your D plus X rule. So kind of complicated. We won't get into too much detail there. But if you ever happen to need it, there you go. So. DX rule and D plus X rule. So any questions on marking thinnings?